What can science tell humanity today in terms of a paradigm for global sustainability in the context of the planetary boundary research we've done? And then in the end, give a couple of ideas of what that can imply for planetary stewardship in, in a planet that increasingly faces the challenge of the Anthropocene. And you've probably seen this science uh, proposed by the Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen almost 10 years back now, but it's not until now that, of course, who decides what geological epoch we're in? It's, of course, the United Kingdom's Royal Society. We all respect that on the planet, so what is on, on our high school's posters in terms of what geological era we're in is today in the hands of the Geological Committee, currently considering whether we're moving out of the Holocene into the Anthropocene. Anthropocene suggesting from empirical evidence that seven billion people multiplied by the industrial metabolism today constitutes a geological force of change at the planetary scale. I often try to communicate to my students that we simply have to relate to the fact that we've entered the 369 world. We are committed with a high likelihood to a warming of at least three degrees, perhaps even four to six degrees as shown by Chris with a likelihood of at least 20%. We've entered the era of the sixth mass extinction of species, the first caused by another species on the planet, and we are committed to nine billion people. This is, this is the world we need to navigate. Science synthesized the evidence behind the Anthropocene on an issue in October 2011, and I think that's important. It's not until recently we have the evidence to show that we've emptied 80% of the fish stocks in the ocean to show that we have the hockey stick patterns, not only for carbon dioxide and population shown here, you can virtually pick any parameter that matters from human well-being. They have the same pattern. Up until the mid-1950s, we see very little impact at the planetary scale. And then 10 years after the Second World War, we're three billion people, and that's when we put in the high gear of what has now been baptized by science as the moment of the great acceleration of the human enterprise. And until just the last 30, 40 years that we have the great exponential pressures on everything from deforestation to eutrophication to climate change. This is the reality we're facing, and it's a reality which is synthesized only in the last five, 10 years. One could argue that this is the most important observation line that science has put forward, and it's not the Dow Jones Index, I can tell you. It is, in fact, as you all know, the extent of summer ice in the Arctic, which relates back to Chris. And I think the drama here is, is twofold. One is, in gray areas here, the best efforts of the best scientists to try to predict what may happen in a business as usual future in the Arctic. And the shock for the world should have been, but certainly for science, of losing 30% summer ice in 2007. Could have been an outlier, but then we see 2010 and 2012 being another absolute low, where science no longer can exclude that the Arctic had entered what has been called the death spiral, meaning that we've entered a new equilibrium. And the reason, of course, is that the feedback mechanism is so well known. And you've probably seen this data from this year from NOAA, which is, I think, the ultimate data on why the world needs to be nervous. This is, as you certainly recognize, the albedo record from satellite data from NOAA over Greenland, and you have seasonality on the x-axis from January to December. We have a 90% reflectivity back of, of heat coming in from the sun in the winter periods, going down to roughly 80% in the summer periods. But then we have the 2012 line going right through the floor when albedo suddenly goes below 50%. For the first time in observational history, science can show that the entire Greenland continent is melting during two weeks in July, which is a first time as far as we know. And the drama is that just calculating the energy absorption of this exceeds 200 exajoules, which is more than the annual energy consumption in the US in one year. So suddenly the planet is shifting gears on its feedbacks from being a cooling agent of reflecting incoming heat to becoming a positive feedback factor, accelerating heat. And this is the big engine starting up. Humanity suddenly becomes the small engine. And science has been, I would argue, and I think many of us in the room would argue, quite well over the past five, 10 years to try and step up and communicate this science. And the most significant one in my mind is when 3,600 global change scientists gather 
for the Planet Under Pressure Conference in the run-up to the Rio conference that Chris referred to, chaired by the late Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom, but also with great work from Mark Stafford Smith in Australia and Lydia Brito from Mozambique, in the State of the Planet Declaration, which for the first time communicates that the current development paradigm from a scientific perspective is a dead end, and that humanity may have reached a saturation point. That we have evidence that humanity may have reached a saturation point. We're simply hitting the ceiling. We're starting to see the first signs of hitting the ceiling of what the planet can cope with and still stay stable and support human development. This is an incredibly dramatic message from science. Is business understanding? Well, yes, even The Economist welcomes humanity to the Anthropocene roughly a year back. And many other medias did so as well. And I'm not sure I dare do the following, but in a typical, I love The Economist, I should say, by the way, but in a typical British understatement in this issue, you may have seen it, they state something which I feel is a good reflection of the sentiment in science in the world today, which is that when reality is changing faster than theory stipulates it should, a certain degree of nervousness is a reasonable response. <laughs> and, and I think the economists really got it there. And, and that's exactly what is happening. The world is changing faster than theory stipulates it should. So what does all this mean? Well, this is really just about the pressures, about the exponential pressures on the planet. How does Mother Earth respond? How does the biosphere respond? And to understand this, we need to dig down in the ecology, the ecosystem service research, and how that links to social ecological resilience. And what we're seeing empirically is, of course, that we have built up our, our understanding in terms of our economic system, our societal development, on the assumption that when conditions change in an ecosystem, the state changes linearly, incrementally, and in predictable ways. That's the assumption in our economic paradigm we have today. We know increasingly from evidence that ecosystems behave much more like this, with long periods of incremental change thanks to inbuilt capacities to absorb and dampen change. But then reaching a certain point when control variables are pushed too far can abruptly shift into a new equilibrium, and that these state shifts are well recognized for many systems on the planet over 30, 40 years of science, and that some systems in fact, also have hysteresis, which means that once you've changed state, it's a much more costly process to bring the system back at its original state. We often illustrate this in the cup and bowl diagrams developed by Buzz Holling and many others over the decades of resilience research. This has to be connected to the challenge, and I would still argue it a scientific challenge, of how does the bundle of ecosystem functions and services build resilience? And in what way can we argue that when we shift a natural ecosystem here, a terrestrial ecosystem, providing a whole range of supportive functions, but few provisional services, when this system is shifted over into an agricultural system of the more modern monocultural type, being good at delivering a few provisional services like food, but being very brittle in terms of having the diversity to respond and the functional diversity to respond to different types of shocks, and what are the systems that could develop resilience into the future? I think we have a lot of evidence to suggest that, in fact, biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services build resilience in landscapes and seascapes, but we still need to continue the pathway of inquiry. And we try to do this at the Resilience Center by taking the approach that, yes, diversity, not only ecological diversity, but also social diversity in terms of flexibility, networks, learning, institutional adaptive capacity, plays a role, of course, in terms of providing, in this case, in the ecological domain, both functional redundancy and response diversity. And we've learned that in so many empirical examples, and, and you are the kind of most, most prominent expert crowd here. But just to take one example with, with the main, the classic main lobster fisheries, which has always been so shown up to be a great success of co-management with yields rising exponentially and enormous wealth creation for human well-being, but recognizing that it's largely a massive monoculture dependent on feedstocks coming in from other seascapes on the planet, and now seeing that this brittle system does not have functional redundancy, which means that when a pest comes in, the whole system tips over and collapses. And that these functions of biodiversity play fundamental role for supporting services in ecosystems, which in turn 
builds the capacity to self-organize and deal with and respond to disturbances, which we call ecosystem resilience, which in turn builds and delivers ecosystem services and thus human well-being. And that this chain of interdependencies and complexities are increasingly understood, and I think that's something we should be very proud of in terms of the advancements of ecological research, but clearly something still needs more science. This is work, for example, from a whole set of young scientists gathered in something called RAISE, which is the, the, the young scholars of the Resilience Alliance, showing that the sources of resilience, in fact, goes beyond only diversity and redundancy, also the ability to understand and deal with slow variables and feedback mechanisms, the connectivity in landscapes between spatial and temporal scales, but that we increasingly also try to recognize that ecosystem resilience is an integral part of society and that in fact in the Anthropocene we're living in a human dominated planet where essentially there are no pristine systems left and that we are dealing with social ecological systems where we also need to have humans as an integral part of stewardship in terms of participation, polycentricity, Lynn Ostrom's massive empirical work on showing how humans and nature can interact at local to regional scales and understanding systems as complex adaptive systems. So we're moving the whole agenda, in my mind, of ecology into the human prosperity domain and into the entire domain of social development. We broaden the resilience definition, just to tick that off, from not only being the ability of systems to stay in a stable state, so basically the capacity to withstand a tipping point, a regime shift, to also include the ability of a social ecological system to adapt to change. So what is the internal learning in a system to adapt to systems of pressure? But also in a crisis, what are the attributes we need in, in societies, landscapes, seascapes, to deal with the crisis and transform into completely new trajectories. There is so much empirical evidence to suggest that this is, I was almost about to say, the universal way ecosystems operate. That's, of course, not entirely true because, for example, for agricultural systems, there is a scientific argument where there are, in fact, state shifts because it's such an anthropogenically um, transformed system. But there's so much evidence from systems from coral reefs, lake systems, savanna systems that have a deep resilience at the outset. We manage these systems not entirely sustainably, so the resilience is gradually eroded, but it continues to deliver ecosystem services, so it appears to be in a good state. And the brittleness makes it very sensitive to shocks and a disease, a drought, a flood, knocks the system over and it gets stuck in a new state under the condition that there's a feedback. And the feedback mechanism is always what we're looking for to understand whether there is, in fact, a state shift. And that's the drama with the Arctic, of course, where the albedo shift is the primary feedback that could take it from an ice sheet state to an ice-free state. We're today hosting something called the Regime Shifts Database, which I would very strongly advise you to, to consult. And, and it's an effort of archiving our knowledge on state shifts in the system, which ranges, of course, from the classic collapse of the cod fisheries outside Newfoundland, a system that we've come to learn very well, all the way to the quite recent science, in fact, that most likely the Baltic Sea has gone through exactly the same trajectory, with a loss of cod fisheries, an explosion of sprat and herring, which has taken up and, and simply eaten up all the zooplankton, the grazers of the system, which combined with eutrophication and global warming has led to an explosion of, of phytoplankton, which in turn consumes all oxygen, and the system gets stuck in an algal bloom frequent state that we are in today. Policy has done tremendous effort in reducing eutrophication. Successfully, the system is still stuck. The way back is much more expensive than the state that took us into an undesired situation. We've recently mapped out, through colleagues in our marine theme and colleagues around the world, the state shifts we see in marine systems, which are increasingly well documented, so it's occurring worldwide, and always again an interaction between trophic states of loads of pressure from particularly agriculture and urban regions, how food webs interact from top predators to pelagic and benthic species, and also how things and processes interact with climate change. So it's never one driver, but a complex set of drivers pushing systems across thresholds.
I think this paper is, is fantastic also in showing James Estes and colleagues' work on showing that it matters what biodiversity we lose as well, that top predators play a particularly important role in terms of knock-on effects in abrupt shifts in ecosystems. Another set of colleagues, including Henrik Oesterblom and others at the Resilience Center, showing that there's a rule of thumb perhaps emerging from empirical evidence that we must leave at least 30% of fish stocks to avoid tipping points of seabird populations across the world. So an empirical evidence that is quite, quite astonishing in terms of understanding the importance of the living biosphere to keep the planet stable. This is potentially the other hotspot as, as apart from the Arctic when it comes to big risks for humanity. Carlos Nobres and many colleagues at, at INPE in Brazil showing increasingly that even the Amazon rainforest cannot be excluded from being pushed over an abrupt tipping point and irreversibly getting stuck in a savanna state. And the reason, of course, is the interactions between land use change, opening up the system and creating turbulence and dry air coming through, interacting with climate change. And here you see the frequency of unprecedented droughts over just the past five years in the Amazon, and, and a real risk of losing a biome, which in turn would be an immediate pulse of carbon of a scale which would vastly exceed our annual emissions of greenhouse gases. And then finally, of course, Anthony Barnowski and colleagues work on the risk of even having a tipping point at the planetary scale in losing genetic diversity with, of course, question marks around the likelihood and the timing, but that we cannot exclude at the pace we're running that we might end up in a type of hysteresis effect also on genetic diversity. So I would just round this up to say, I think there's so much evidence today to say that, yes, the world is changing faster than theory stipulates it should, and it's not linear. One more dimension that we need to recognize is that we're always still operating and being stewards at the nation scale, which is not optimal and doable any longer. This is just one example, apart from the Arctic, which in turn, if the Arctic would in fact flip over, could lead to in itself a pulse of another one degree warming. And Greenland, of course, as you're all aware, holds seven meter sea level rise. But this is Borneo. This is a rainforest system, one of the three remaining in the world, losing 50% of its forest cover over the last 30 years. And this is, of course, an enormous concern for biodiversity, for indigenous communities. But what we're more and more learning is that there's teleconnections between this forest and its connective, uh, con uh, convective rainfall patterns and how it affects the Asian monsoon, the Asian brown cloud, and therefore the feedbacks not only into the climate system but also into the world market prices of food. So increasingly realizing that these regional big biomes matter for any nation's finance minister, any nation's prime minister in their own work for wealth creation. This, I think, is one of the most dramatic recent findings from colleagues like Lena Gordon and Huub Savene at the TU Delft in the Netherlands, showing that we've underestimated the sources, the importance of the biosphere, the terrestrial biosphere, in terms of generating rainfall. Of course, much of the rainfall is still generated from oceans, particularly in the blue areas here, where the predominant source of rainfall is evaporation and heat exchange with the ocean land interface. But the red areas are areas which are estimated to have more than 80% of rainfall from convective rainfall coming from neighboring land. So 80% of the rainfall in the Yellow River region in China depends on rainfall from the former Soviet states around Ukraine, Russia, all the way to the Baltic. This is, of course, a geopolitic bomb to realize that the stewardship and management of ecosystems is equally important for your own rainfall as it is for the provisioning of nation, local state well-being. So interconnectedness, I think, also is a new rule of the game to realize that we all need to be stewards of the remaining critical biomes. So what does all this mean for a framework for global sustainability? Well, we tried three, four years back to connect these two lines of science, the recognition of the Anthropocene and the risk of catastrophic regime shifts in the biosphere. What does all this mean if we really start to connect the pressures of the Anthropocene and abrupt shifts. Well, this is what led to the question, are we in a situation where we need to suddenly consider the risk of destabilizing the Earth's system as a whole? Now, to answer that question, we first, of course, need to define what is the desired state for the planet to support the modern world as we know it.
And interestingly, even though challenging, I would argue that we have an answer to this question. And that comes, of course, from the great work from glaciology. And here is one empirical evidence to this, but I can tell you there are many different ice core data supporting exactly this, this finding. This is the last 100,000 years. We often look at glaciology and ice core data over one million years, but this is a good period to pick out because we've been modern humans on the planet for roughly 160,000 years. So this is a period where we've had the same physical and intellectual capacity of developing civilizations as we knew it. We were modern humans right through this period. On the y-axis, you have variability in temperature. This is Greenland ice data, so you have a temperature amplification, which shows in Celsius degrees from zero to minus 20. And as I'm sure you're aware, this was a jumpy ride indeed for humanity. In fact, recent data by Steve Oppenheimer and colleagues at this very cold point here, when most of the fresh water was frozen in the poles and we had 70 meter lower sea level rise, indicates that we were down to 15,000 fertile adults on planet Earth. We were virtually extinct and we're clearly all family. Now, it meant that we were 15,000 stuck in the highlands of Ethiopia, and that's where we left for the Asian journey back to Europe. And we are, during this entire period, hunters and gatherers. We're a few million people on the planet. We're having, to put it simple, a rough time until we enter what you could call the Eden's Garden of the Holocene. And as you're all aware, we barely enter it, and we invent agriculture, the most important invention since humans on Earth, and off we go in the civilizational journey. We all know we're three billion people at the point of the Great Acceleration. We're now seven committed to nine, and we know the Holocene fairly well. It's a period where temperatures on average on the planet vary with plus minus one degree. It's the period where all the genetic diversity built up over the hundreds of millions of years settle into the ecosystem configuration as we know it. This is when the seascapes and landscapes, the wetlands, the savannas, the temperate and boreal forests settle in and deliver the ecosystem functions and services that has built our wealth. So the conclusion is as simple as dramatic. The Holocene is, as far as science is concerned, the only state of the planet that can support the modern world as we know it, if we take a moral responsibility for a world of nine billion people. We, we can live here as well but we won't be the modern world as we know it. Taking this as a standpoint, the question then was to leading global environmental change scientists, so what are then the environmental processes we need to be stewards of to maintain Holocene-like conditions? We are in the Anthropocene. We have to be stewards and realize that we are putting pressures and extinction of species cannot be turned back, but can we stay in Holocene-like state of equilibrium? Can we maintain, for example, the two ice caps, the Antarctic and the Arctic, which seem to be absolute preconditions for the equilibrium we're in. And the result of that, as you may be aware, was the suggestion that one way forward for humanity is in fact the definition of planetary boundaries. A very simple concept of saying, what are the Earth system processes that are connected to the stability in Holocene-like conditions? And could we, for each one of those processes, look at a control variable that we could quantify and using the latest science define points beyond which we cannot exclude nonlinear abrupt change which would have deleterious if not catastrophic implications for humanity. The result here was a suggestion of nine planetary boundary processes and an effort of quantifying seven of those which would provide humanity with what we called a safe operating space. Now, the importance of this concept is that it doesn't put a limit to growth. It simply provides a playing field within which growth can occur. And I'll come back to a few of those quantifications and also give an update of where we are today. I just want to emphasize that the planetary boundary framework did not come from the sky or be a kind of a, a, a big step change in any way. It was rather an evolutionary natural next step in a scientific advancement that has been going on for 50 years in earth system science, in the work from ecological economics and Kenneth Boulding's spaceship earth economics in the 1960s, to resilient science and the clear research on tipping elements and guardrails, which came about and together in this concept. It's a clear movement to say forward from limits to growth, which 
had to take normative assumptions on our ingenuity and our demands to define limits. It got away with that, which also is something that plagues approaches of carrying capacities, to simply delink humanity from the planet Earth's stability. Plan planetary boundaries simply asks, what are the biophysical boundaries beyond which we might have a state change? Then humanity can be put back into the safe operating space and have whatever desires and demands and innovations you might, um, you, you might cater for. We consider two types of processes. One type of process that clearly has a control variable with defined, empirically observed threshold behavior. Within each control variable for a system, the most obvious example being climate change, we took carbon dioxide concentration as a control variable, looking at what is the zone of uncertainty in our scientific knowledge, placing that on the table, we landed at a range from 350 to 550 ppm, and putting the boundary, and this is the normative part of the framework, at the lower end of the uncertainty zone as a way of applying a precautionary principle, saying that once you've gone beyond, in our case, the 350 ppm boundary, you don't know what happens. And the Arctic is an example that this seems to be working for climate change. But importantly, we also include processes that don't have empirical evidence of planetary scale tipping points, but they qualify as planetary boundaries if they function in the engine room of the Earth system complexity. If they are processes and systems which determine the capacity of the systems with big thresholds to stay stable, such as land use, sequestering carbon as a way of stabilizing the climate system, or if they are systems that have tipping points and abrupt shift behavior, but they occur at the local scale, and if they would occur in many enough places on planet Earth simultaneously, would be a feedback that could affect both human societies at a large scale and the stability of the planet. So these were the two kind of criteria which ended up with these nine quantifications, which then importantly include not only those with big global threshold behavior like climate change, stratospheric ozone, and ocean acidification, which clearly has empirical evidence of large-scale tipping points, but also the four slow variables that do not have that empirical evidence, but which determine from the biosphere landscape scale the stability of systems, the interference with the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, rate of biodiversity loss, land use change, and freshwater use. And then this group of scientists suggested that our human, the new entities of chemical pollution, particularly endocrine disruptors and nuclear waste, together with the entire complex of aerosol loading, probably are candidates of planetary boundaries as well because they could affect the genome of species, including humans, and that they have big impacts on particularly the functioning of the regional hydrological cycle on the planet. Where are we then on this research today? Well, right as we speak, we're updating based on a lot of the scientific debate that was generated once it was published in 2009. We are coupling each boundary not only with a global definition, but also trying to take it down to the regional scale, which was one of the discussions that has arisen. So for land system change, for example, shifting from the area of cropland to the reverse side, what, how much forest systems do we need to maintain on the planet to keep Holocene-like conditions? Suggesting that perhaps that is in the order of 75% from the early Holocene in the, tropical, uh, in the global scale, but also bringing it down, what are the critical biomes that clearly have a critical role in sustaining stability? And could we find evidence of where tipping points are? For example, for the tropical rainforest systems at roughly 85% forest cover. For biodiversity also, a lively debate was, was triggered when this was published. Georgina knows much about that, has been involved in helping us move this forward. We suggested, as, as you're aware perhaps, to use extinction rate, which was really a proxy because it was the only data that we could find. Thanks very much to the Millennium System Assessment and Georgina and, and others' work, and many of you are here in the room. But also adding mean species abundance as a complement to address the whole issue of functional diversity, which is one suggestion to do, and drawing, for example, on Bob Scold and others' work on a rule of thumb of that when we lose more than 70%, no, more than 30% of functional diversity in ecosystem, we can see evidence of abrupt changes. And this is an ongoing work and, and, and all input is very welcome. It was criticized also for 
not being um, correct on phosphorus. Uh, Steve Carpenter and Elna Bennett made a very important observation that we had taken only the risk of phosphorus reaching the ocean and tipping points of big, big anoxic events in the marine systems driven by phosphorus. They pointed out rightly that much, much, much before you get tipping points in the ocean, you'll have multiple tipping points in freshwater systems upstream in the phosphorus journey through the landscape. So they've added a freshwater phosphorus boundary under different assumptions of fluxes into the ocean, showing that most likely we've already transgressed the phosphorus boundary because of the multiple tipping points in freshwater systems. And then you may have seen a lot of the, the debate that has been arisen, not least in the run-up to Rio, because in Rio, the Civil Society Forum placed planetary boundaries as an important concept to guide humanity in the Anthropocene. And a lot of discussions was raised in The Economist, in Nature, and some criticism, which had two main strides. One was that there is no evidence for some of these boundaries of global scale tipping points. And that is a misunderstanding, which we rectified, because it was never the case that all processes had to have global scale tipping points, as I just referred to. Interestingly, though, we never suggested a global biodiversity tipping point, but recent research suggests there may be one but also a very healthy discussion following on, on the publication on whether net primary production, in fact, could be a ninth or an integrating planetary boundary. Just last week, uh, response in science suggesting that, in fact, we probably got it right to have land and the, as the basic foundational boundary rather than net primary production. And the second critique, which I find almost a bit uh, amusing, is the critique that, well, you know, planetary boundaries sound conceptually interesting, but it's not polish relevant. And, and I find that almost a bit irritating because the reason why we published this work in 2009 was to challenge science. It was really a way of trying to get a more integrative Earth system research for global sustainability going. It was not to influence policy. But those think tanks that feel threatened by this concept clearly think so much in policy terms and took that on as the critique. So we found that actually quite a quite an healthy critique in the end. Now, I just want to, before coming to the end of, of my just moving into the, the, the options for planetary stewardship, just give you one example of how we went about defining one of the key planetary boundaries, which is on ocean acidification. You may have seen this, this very dramatic graph of pH in the world's ocean with proxy data going back to 25 million years. And look at this data with a stable ocean of roughly 8 in the pH level and the dramatic decline from the start of the Industrial Revolution. I find this a perfect graph, by the way, in discussing with climate skeptics, because if, if you have a discussion on the physical side of the climate change coin, how much global warming will have with a doubling of CO2, for example, here is the chemical crisis of climate change, which is high school chemistry, which is zero uncertainty, because no one else kicked this off and the lowering of the pH in the oceans, which you are, and, and many of the experts are, of course, in the room here, has dramatic implications for marine life because when carbon dioxide reacts with water, it creates carbonic acid, which in turn uh, connects with calcium carbonate and breaks up the building blocks, the Lego blocks for all marine life. And we took the most sensitive calcium carbonate, aragonite, as a good proxy for a planetary boundary on ocean acidification looking through the data on aragonite saturation state on the planet. And this is one estimate, for example, showing a very high level of aragonite, calcium carbonate, in the pre-industrial state of the planet. And not surprisingly, I'm, I'm sure you in the back won't see the, the black dots here, which is the tropical coral reefs. They all settled in when there's good access to legal building blocks. And this is the state today, and this is the projection under business as usual. A very clear trajectory of a dramatic decline in aragonite in the world's oceans. We picked as best as we could the state-of-the-art science on what is the global aragonite saturation rate today, where are we heading under different climate scenarios, and where could you propose a boundary where you start seeing risks of nonlinear big abrupt changes. For example, we see already today evidence that the Arctic Ocean is already corrosive to calcium carbonate and we place the boundary at the lower end of that uncertainty range. And then, of course, ocean acidification could, that boundary could become more sensitive if, for example, bleaching 
as shown by the WRI um, uh, Reefs at Risk report, if we end up in this situation, where in fact over 80, 90 percent of the years will have coral breaching, which in turn would potentially move that boundary even further. So that's one of the difficulties with the whole planetary boundary approach, that all the nine seem to have a three musketeers behavior, one for all, all for one, and the interactions need to be better understood, and that's one of the ongoing research areas. Then finally, just on interactions, to show also another evidence why the, the slow-moving boundaries are absolutely critical to understand what is required to stay in Holocene-like conditions. You've probably seen this fantastic work from um, colleagues in the Global Carbon Project and also this paper that came out recently in Nature, showing that, yes, our emission of, of greenhouse gases have accumulated to 350 gigatons of carbon, but at the same time, we have this impressive growing sink capacity in the biosphere, which has increased in pace with global emissions. But the drama here is particularly that look at the 1960s, the estimates that the biosphere absorbed two gigatons, roughly half in the oceans, half on land, the half in the ocean causing rapid pH decline. Today, the estimate is that the biosphere absorbs four and a half gigatons. So there's this impressive increase in the biosphere's effort of trying to reduce and dampen the effect of our energy disturbance on the system. So what's happening is the planet is applying resilience theory in the real world. It's trying to apply its biogeochemical processes to stay in Holocene-like equilibrium. And as you've probably seen from Steve Running and his work, we're starting to see the first signs of decline of this sink capacity, reaching a saturation point. So here we have the proof that some of these slow variables in the biosphere are absolutely critical for planetary stability in support of world development. So then just my final um, five, 10 minutes before closing here. So what does all this mean moving forward? Well, to begin with, I, I totally agree with Chris, of course. We see no signs in this world of planetary stewardship actually occurring. If anything, the hope we see is bottom up from businesses moving forward, communities, and some nations. And I would say, in fact, that the UK has, has, is even a step ahead of Sweden these days on addressing issues of sustainability. Don't quote me there on my home turf, though, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, so the question is what next in a world where the front pages will not look only like this in terms of financial and social turbulence, it's interacting with ecological turbulence, so we have this new complexity in the world. And this is no doubt pushing us towards crisis points, and crisis points can be very doomy and gloomy, but are also, of course, historically the only places where transformative change has occurred in the past. And the key issue now is how can we navigate this future? How can we find opportunities arising from situations where we have learned and understand the crisis we're in, but also see the options of moving towards transformative change. There's very little, very little sign of that in climate, very little signs of that overall on biodiversity, but of course, as Chris also pointed out, there are cases in the world, like for example, the stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef, which has totally shifted under the pressures of scientific evidence. The revolution of agriculture in Latin America, where they put aside the plow and now have a massive regional scale, zero till agricultural revolution, which is binding carbon, building, more yields, livelihoods, and also water capacities, and some isolated cases of making the landscapes critical functions of sustainable urban development. This is, I think, a, a critical map showing that in a future where we're risking the world's coral reefs already by 2050, 2060, 2070, there's clearly an ability to adapt and to govern systems more say cleverly and therefore also in a more resilient way in certain parts of the world compared to other parts of the world. That it matters how we are stewards of these big systems under rapidly changing conditions. While not omitting that of course the mitigating agenda is more important than ever. Led by John Foley and colleagues, we recently published uh, a paper in Nature trying to answer the question, well, can we feed a world of nine billion people through sustainable intensification? Can we, in fact, take the planetary boundaries seriously and not expand ourselves into feeding the world into the future? I would argue that already the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment made the point that expanding agriculture is, is a dead end because we're losing too much ecological functions and resilience. And this paper at least suggests that the yield gaps in most of the tropical agricultural systems is so large 
that through sustainable investments in tillage systems, ecological sanitation, water harvesting systems, and different forms of biological pest management, you can, in fact, feed the world of 9 billion people. So there is, you know, not just a dark future, but a pos possibility to move ahead on what I would argue is perhaps one of the most important trajectories to feed the world from sustainable agriculture, which would solve the eutrophication challenge, 30% of the climate challenge, large parts of the biodiversity challenge in a world which is currently moving in the wrong direction. So what is science doing? Well, as Georgina referred to, I would argue science is doing a lot today, really stepping up to this integrated challenge, recognizing that we can no longer do great global environmental change research, which has been fundamental in understanding the predicament we're in, but we need to recognize that today, global sustainability is a prerequisite also for local development, and the global environmental change is today interacting with world development. We've entered the globalized phase of environmental change, and this led to the endeavor, which has now been planned and consulted and dialogued for almost three years, leading up to the birth from 1st of January 2013 of Future Earth, which is a major endeavor of integrating and joining forces among the global environmental change programs under the International Council for Science and the International Social Science Council, which have you know, built the bulk of our knowledge base over the past 30 years to launch a program which not only does the deep disciplinary research, which is still fundamental, but looks much more into also integrated solutions to support a transformation to global sustainability. This is really exciting and an opportunity for science also to step in to something that is very difficult, but also on the agenda, to do co-design and co-production of knowledge with stakeholders across society. But still, the, the deeper challenge is still there. I would argue clearly that our science shows that our current paradigm of development is in fact, even in Ban Ki-moon's words, not going to carry us forward for the prosperity we want in the future. In fact, we need to go back to Herman Daly's steady state economic model and, and recognize that the economy is, is a subset and a tool to provide human well-being and growth is therefore something that needs to be confined within that endeavor, which has to occur within the confines of a safe operating space on planet Earth. In simple terms, go from our current paradigm, growth without limits. We passed through a period of discussing limits to growth. Now it's clearly growth within limits. In a world with nine billion people, moreover, you may have seen this fantastic work by Oxfam and Cates uh, Roworth, um, saying that, well, biophysical boundaries are fine, providing a ceiling, but there must be a social floor on a crowded planet. There must be a right to development which would eat up a certain part of the ecological capacity on planet Earth. And if you take that notion seriously, if you have to relate to physical boundaries at the ceiling and a social right and equity-based sharing, then of course we're in an entirely new domain. So it's not surprising that these scientific advancements are seen as challenging and even provocative for the current conventional paradigm for many nations in the world today. So what then, in closing, are a couple of reflections. Well, the first is that world development in the Anthropocene, where socio-ecological turbulence is likely to increase, requires that we reconnect our societies with the biosphere. It's a simple notion, but clearly we have disconnected and we built an economic paradigm that's, so to say, subsidized by the planet's functioning. And now is the time in a saturation era to recognize that that era has ended. We need a widened development paradigm that moves away from the classic assumption that efficiency and optimization always works and substitutability is always there. The normal assumption of a small world on a big planet, now it's a big world on a small planet, where resilience and global sustainability are critical functions for local societies and nations. And that evidence, I would argue, indicates that this requires investments in redundancy. And you may define redundancy in whatever way, diversity, flexibility, multiple functions, configuration of landscapes. A simple way is to simply call it what most of us would define as the beauty on planet Earth. And it's not only about ecological diversity, it's of course also about flexibility, cooperation and learning when we are in the Anthropocene. And that this in turn can be encapsulated, I think, to the lady who started it all, Rachel Carson. I think this is a beautiful 
citation, quote from her, that I believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we will have for destruction. Now what science is showing is that not only was she right, but it's also about prosperity. It's about diversity and beauty for prosperity. It's not just a moral choice and responsibility, it's actually the toolbox for our own well-being. But of course it's not easy because as Albert Einstein pointed out, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. Thank you very much.